Hello. Hi. Um, hello. Thank you for the greeting. Um, before I get down the names uh, for today, I want to just begin with um, a word of encouragement that I, um, I finally turned in my grades to my other school uh, summer semester uh, class. And um, I'm going to give more TLC to you guys uh, as far as grading, uh, feedback, um, uh, videos. And matter of fact, with the videos, um, I just put up a couple videos. I, re I had realized that, um, that you guys are short of videos uh, by the last few um, as far as like a supplementary you know, source to look to. Um, what I'm going to do is on those assignments that were missing a video, I'm going to extend the, um, the due date and uh, allow you guys to do redos because you have on all the assignments, I, I, I believe that I, I leave it open for unlimited submissions. And so if you'd like to look at the video and then do what you might think could be a, a better job, um, you're free to do that without it being marked uh, as late. All right, I feel like that's the least I can do uh, to make up for that shortcoming. Uh, but hopefully that won't happen again. Um, and uh, uh, I have just you guys now, and I'll I'll be uh, more on top of this situation. All right. So thank you for your um, your patience. Hope you guys are coming along uh, fairly well. As we're already uh, gearing toward uh, test two, so it's crazy how quickly uh, the summer semester goes by. All right. And so I'm going to um, let's see here put down the names so you can get your extra credit, okay? So thank you for, for showing up today. Let's see here. This always takes me a while and I apologize, but I just, I don't know how else to, to do it. All right, uh, let's see here. You know. And of course, it's not an alphabet alphabetized order. Let's see here. Yes. So getting into this, uh, let's see if I can multitask or at least try to do such. Um, recall that um, you guys have, uh, hopefully you guys felt okay uh, with, the, um, with the constitution assignment which has already been due. Um, hopefully uh, those of you were at least that were able to um, attend the Zoom, I hope that I eventually came around to, uh, sufficiently um, prepping you for that. I, I certainly hope so. All right, and then um, let's see here. Going on to the next one, I believe I did a bit of an introduction to it, uh, but but let's go ahead and go uh, deeper into it. And that is Great Man History of the Early Republic. And please note the beginning, if you've had a chance to look at it already. Uh, great Man History does not imply that the, the men that are being studied uh, were morally great men. Uh, oftentimes, uh, no problem, Valeria. Uh, they, um, what is implied by that is that it's with causation, right? And it's the idea of what causes events to happen. What, and of course that's subjective and historians are never gonna be on the same page uh, concerning that. But some, and this is kind of old school history writing, uh, but I thought I would at least do it once uh, in the semester, is uh, some people believe uh, events happen and in particular, you know, um, events, uh, pertaining to uh, American history. Okay, Valeria. Um, well, it's up to you, Valeria. I could either um, I could either address that after because I need to catch up on my messages. All right. So I could either address your question and issues uh, on Canvas message uh, between the two of us, or if you like, if you want to unmute yourself and ask me now. Um, I'm willing to do that as well. It's up to you, Valeria. Okay, you got it. All right. And so, you know, and I always reserve the right to um, to make exceptions. I have that in my syllabus. 
because uh, normally, right, if something is late, I take 10 points off. Uh, at the end of the semester, when people are doing for partial credit, you know, early colonial stuff that's like, you know, a month late, then I take 20 off. Um, but I always am willing to make exceptions. And, you know, life happens. And especially if something is not clear, if you did not adequately understand uh, what was asked of you on the assignment, like in the case of the Constitution, it being a different type of assignment, then of course I'm not going to hold that against you. All right, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'd like to think a reasonable person. Okay, and so, um, so please communicate with me and um, let me know. All right, and I'll do better uh, from here on out and trying to make things clear and trying to prepare you with all the supplemental data and material you need uh, to do well uh, on these assignments. All right. So uh, let's see here, Brianna Cortez, are you, I can't think, new? All right, so let's look at, if you don't mind, great man history of the early Republic. So again, as I mentioned here, no, great man history does not imply that the subjects were morally great. Rather, it implies an old school assumption that understanding past historical eras emanates primarily from studying each era's leaders and power, all right? So, like I said, I only do this once in our class on the on one time period, one topic. I thought, what better time period to employ great man history than the generation of the founding fathers, right? The most arguably famous generation of leaders of, the, of our country. So at any rate, I begin on number one with a slight vilification of Alexander Hamilton. Now I give him the benefit of the doubt in reality, okay, that he really was not that uber conservative, that on the ideological spectrum, he was, he was in the center in many ways. He maybe a little bit to the right, like they do that from the French Revolution, uh, conservative, wanting old school traditional institutions and, and customs uh, sat on the right side of the uh, state uh, as general, and those who wanted radical change, uh, et cetera, sat on the left. He was on the right of the political spectrum. He was conservative and kind of old school in some ways and that he wanted a strong central government he wanted a strong, powerful executive as the president. Um, he wanted to do things that were not necessarily explicitly stated and given to the government in the Constitution uh, in the name of pragmatism, of just getting done what he thought needs to be done. So yes, all that is true. But I say that he really, in many ways, you know, he was an abolitionist against slavery. He was for checks and balances. He was for an enlightened federal, you know, republic that we had. Um, he was not like for an emperor uh, with checks uh, and powers against the elected legislator or anything crazy like that. But according to number one, image is almost everything, right? And when he became the secretary of treasury, he acted in such a way to give the public impression of being uber conservative and that it literally frightened the, the founding fathers generations liberals into forming an oppositional party against him. And a case in point of that is James Madison who had written the constitution. So clearly, you know, he, he supported that conservative document um, and he switched sides, basically, became alarmed by what he saw to be the excesses of Hamilton. So take a look at the examples that I give, all right, uh, to convey that point, that, that, that um, Hamilton publicly portrayed himself in, in a, such a conservative manner that it scared people that it literally scared the country into an oppositional party, and thus was born uh, the two-party system, 
right? That's not a, that up to date of a thesis. Uh, it's been around for a while, but I thought that it was salient enough uh, for those of you who go on to history majors that you should be familiar with it, right? Then number two, uh, the thesis gives much of it away, is this is core history. This is core history of John Adams, the second president. Now, John Adams was not, by almost anyone's standards, uh, the most popular of the founding fathers. Um, he is oftentimes, along with Hamilton, uh, been labeled as amongst the most conservative of the founding fathers. He has some quotes that are rather um, elitist uh, in kind of say, conveying the fact that he didn't believe the majority of common Americans uh, were capable of um, running the reins of government, that they should elect their betters, their educated, prepared, superiors into office to do it for him. So in some ways, he's not a very popular president. And then even in his own time period, he wasn't, arguably, um, because he became the first, uh, as our second president after Washington, became our first one-term president who lost re-election uh, to Jefferson. He and Jefferson had quite a feud, uh, ideological and personal. So McCullough takes a kind of a, you know, a refreshingly different stance as he defends this not so popular president. In record history, as you defend the leaders, you justify what they did, you praise them as exceptional, et cetera, et cetera. McCullough in his biography on Adams says, this guy's virtue is what did him in politically, okay? And as you see there at the beginning of the section, it's conveyed in his book that in order to politically survive and thrive in our two-party federal Republican system, that you need to pick a side, pick a, a party, and follow the party line, whether you personally agree with each issue, each stance on each issue or not. And you adhere faithfully to your party's platform to ensure your party's, right, um, faithful support. But he says, John Adams had a mind of his own, had integrity. And he didn't care what the Federalist Party that he kind of adhered to uh, wanted from him. And he certainly didn't care what the Democratic Republican Party, the liberals, uh, wanted from him. That according to McCullough, it came down to his religion, ultimately. That as a, a vocally Christian president, he wanted on each given issue to do what he thought was right in God's eyes. So in towing his own line ethically, John Adams ended up alienating himself from both parties. So see the examples that I give from the book of manners by which he alienated himself from both. You have the Alien and Sedition Acts. You have the almost or quasi-war with France and his harsh, uh, you know, um, objection to the French Revolution because the liberals here in the country were for the French Revolution. Right? But then look how when, when it comes to the conservatives, He would not go to war with revolutionary France. He wouldn't go that far, officially. He would not really carry out the Alien and Sedition Acts, although they were passed by his Federalist 
dominated Congress. He recognized the Black Republic of Haiti and was outspokenly against slavery. So he alienated the conservatives and the liberals. And McCullough says, for his virtue, no good deed goes unpunished. He was, he was ousted after one term. All right. So that's number two. Because please remember, you guys, you need to um, be familiar with these for the test, for test two, right? Because, um, yeah, and, and despite the fact that you only have to choose one for this particular assignment. Number three, I don't think I wrote it that well. I don't know if you've had a chance to read it. It's very different. I wrote it as fictitiously as Jefferson in the first person. All right. But the point, the thesis of this book, I still think is worth conveying, is worth sharing to students. I find it just fascinating. When I read this chapter of Hofstadter's book, uh, you know, I'm saying this with tongue in cheek, that I wanted to give Jefferson a hug after reading his chapter on him. So the book is called American Political Tradition. It goes back all the way to like the 1960s. That's how cool this book is, is it's still popular from that, that late of a date by Richard Hofstadter. And each chapter, he has a psychological thesis about a different president or American leader. And this pertains to the chapter on Jefferson. So what you want to look for on this one, okay, is the tie between Jefferson's childhood and his eventual decision to identify himself as a Democratic president. Okay. According to number three, there was an absolute direct tie. When he was president, as our third president, there were complaints that he walked around the White House and answered his own door. He refused to, and, and he would answer in slippers and a robe with his hair all disheveled. He would have grandees from Europe come by appointment to dine with him. And he would purposely uh, invite poor neighbors because Washington DC, right? That part of Maryland uh, back then was very impoverished, a very humble, swampy uh, grounds, uh, inauspicious looking spot to put our nation's capital. So he had literally poor neighbors. And he invited them to dinner. And sometimes he would give the silent treatment and, and ignore the, the, the privileged high-ranking guests to their you know, frustration and consternation. And he would instead like to talk with the poor peasants uh, that lived nearby the White House. According to Hofstadter, that was not a coincidence. That was a result of, what's the word I'm thinking of from psychology? Uh, suppression of family issues demonstrated vented cathartically um, in a very um, passive aggressive way. He never thought that his father's approval always in his mind eluded him. 
and take a look at number three, the circumstances that his father came from. He wanted dad's approval. And some people think he was still trying to earn that approval and dealing with issues of guilt and compensation when he reached out to the common people. It's a fascinating book, fascinating chapter, all right? So please, if you would, regardless of which one you choose, uh, read number three, however poorly written it is. Then number four, had you used the textbook, this is the thesis on that given chapter in the textbook that I usually use uh, on Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, William McKinley, and Woodrow Wilson. In my estimation, those three presidents of all of them in US history are most often um, portrayed as puzzles, as enigmas, as paradoxes, right? Like who are these three guys? Because namely, especially with Woodrow Wilson and Thomas Jefferson that we're dealing with here, is when you look at the gap, the, di the disparity um, between what they wrote down and how they acted, there seems to be a contradiction. So for instance, Thomas Jefferson had correspondence with a French colleague and they became collected together, his letters to him as notes on the state of Virginia. And it was made into a book that we can now read. In it, Jefferson is a, a product of the enlightenment. He's against slavery. He's against the Ansan regime, everything that was before the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. He's for accountability, transparency, limited government checks and balances, right? All that good stuff. But notice all the things he does or doesn't do when he becomes president of the United States in a very you know, neat year, 1800, exactly, is when he's elected to 1808. So he comes in and he is a, an adherent to Adam Smith and his wealth and poverty of nations and his notions of a free market and capitalism. And he always said he hated Hamilton's system that it was an English old traditional system, that it was a mercantilist system, that it was plutocratic run by the rich. Well, he comes in, but guess what? He doesn't kill Hamilton's system. His bank, all the subsidies out to businesses, the um, loans through bonds that the government's getting from the rich. Jefferson doesn't change any of it, All right? So what the heck? So then moving on. Jefferson wanted a crusade against ignorance. He wanted a public school system. Well, that didn't happen when he was president. That's not gonna happen until you know, the 1830s and 40s. It spreads throughout multiple states. So it's still decades from happening. The Louisiana Purchase. Jefferson stated as a libertarian that it is imperative for future generations 
for governments not to incrementally grab more and more powers for themselves generation after generation by doing things that are not explicitly given them permission for them to do in the Constitution. Well, nowhere in the Constitution under Article 2, et cetera, does it state that the executive branch can purchase territory. But he does, right? And then when he's governor, then when he, he, he grabs this huge swath of land for the country, right? He's Mr. I believe in the sagacity, right? And the worldly wisdom and common sense of the common American poor person. All right, well then put your money where your mouth is and allow democratic government in the Louisiana territory. No. He, put, he puts hand-picked boards of men, one in the north, one in the south, said they're not ready yet for representative government. So you notice he just keeps kind of contradicting his own rhetoric. Then, in the, in the Declaration of Independence, he wrote amongst his grievances against George III and previous kings and queens of England that they would go to war for trivial reasons such as wounded pride and isolated incidents of, you know, of an atrocity of a few people, etc. And then for that reason, justify pulling thousands of young boys out of their homes and cities into the armed forces to die in battle. And he says, executives, powers should not have that power over the youth. Um, so what does he do in North Africa, in Tunisia? Is he finds out that there is piracy running rampant in the Mediterranean. He sends the USS Philadelphia without congressional permission or knowledge to punish the, the Basha of Tripoli, right? A Muslim official there. And instead they're captured and held for ransom. And he pays secretly and sends a guy named William Eaton to go rescue them without going to Congress, asking for a declaration of war. So this eventually gets out. Congress finds out, and they're not happy with Jefferson. But he's doing what he had complained about with kings before. And then, of course, slavery. He wrote scathingly of slavery in notes on the state of Virginia, as well as on the original Declaration of Independence. And it was so virulent that the founding fathers made him cr cross it out. But he doesn't free his own slaves. He writes also in notes on the state of Virginia that a slave could never be honest with his or her master because of the unequal, tyrannical, you know, uh, context of their relationship. And he says it's an example of, of this egregiously um, blind nature of, of the slave owner is his thinking that he could have sexual relations with a female slave. Because of course he'll never really know if it was truly consensual. Well, he has relations with a female slave, Sally Hemings, and they had four kids. And when word got out, Beverly, uh, who happened to be a, a son, one of the one of the eldest, uh, was just about ready to be freed. And Jefferson, his dad told him, no, son, we've got to let this storm pass. I can't free you yet. 
And so Beverly just fled and left. With the young boy, Eston, he had a more of a, he provided more evidence of having a warm emotional connection to him. And they both grieved when Eston left, but he never publicly would stand up for and claim these children and his, his relationship with Sally Hemings. At one point, they would travel to France because they were more progressive at that time in, in allowing African-Americans to, to do more and to be thought of as equals, roughly. And she threatened to stay there uh, with the kids that she had. And Jefferson had to beg her and supposedly grant her a bargain uh, regarding their, their freedom uh, for her return to the United States, to especially to the South, uh, to Virginia. So instead of just calling Jefferson a hypocrite, instead of saying that, well, when he wrote all this stuff, he was young and people change, oftentimes becoming more conservative and intolerant in age, People change, some people say, with power. That power changed him. And you could find those, those theses, those arguments in other books. But Brinkley, with this textbook I sometimes use, is more sympathetic, right? It's kind of going back to number three. Jefferson was terribly, terribly non-confrontational. And so that he contends that Jefferson believed that forces beyond his control, opposition that was just too strong to contend with, gave him no choice but to become practical or pragmatic instead of idealistic as when he was young. Idealistic, you want to change and improve the world. Pragmatic, you don't care about right or wrong. You don't care about improvement. You just do in any given situation, whatever yields the best practical, useful results. So that's, that's the thesis with number four. That's how he reconciles all these contradictions between what he practiced and what he preached. Yes, Julie? Oh, I just kind of wanted to clarify because I was a little confused. Um, so between section three and four, basically in section three, he's just seen as like a very good person, especially around the poor. And then in section four is that he kind of grew up out of that and became more practical around the way he did things rather than what he had seemed like. That, that is a great, that is a great intelligent question that I'm not sure I could adequately uh, answer is okay. the, the answer. Uh, basically, what you said is kind of rhetorical is, is yes, I would say, okay. is this this man is riddled with paradox. Um, he absolutely uh, that that's what's so fascinating about him is what you find in three and four uh, from my sources are, are equally true. Uh, this man went out of his way to help the common person. This guy wrote so vehemently against slavery and, and, and on certain grounds, uh, seemed so enlightened for his time period. But yet what you'll read in number four is also true. He was just very much a, a, a paradox of a man, an enigma, just a puzzle. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. But yeah, remember, right, though, is that even with number three, even he's suggesting, right, that because, because yes, you're right, uh, Hofstadter brags about what Jefferson does for the poor in his chapter on him. But remember, he also was conveying his point, his, his opinion, that it was passive aggression um, 
that and and a desire to please his dad because as you'll see i didn't want to give it all away because i wanted to make you read it but but um with number three is is there was um there was a lot of class tension in his house uh between his aristocratic mom and his aristocratic mom's parents and his commoner dad and so that that conveyed that that um that played a, a part says Hofstadter in him being passive aggressive against the powers that be and those who put on airs and were uh, prideful and 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 snobbish and and that maybe it wasn't totally sincere what he did for the poor but maybe it was a way of 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 dealing with his own wealth guilt and trying to impress even long after he had died. Um, his commoner dad saying, see, dad, I'm not a snob like mom and, and your in-laws. Uh, I, I love the common people just like you. So, so kind of just like putting up a, like a front, basically. Yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'd like to give Jefferson a little bit more credit than that, 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 it, that it wasn't just, you know, necessarily fake. But that, but yet it was definitely kind of contrived that he, he was, he was forcing it. He was making it happen because he was trying to, to deal with his own psychological issues of trying to sleep better at night, not thinking of himself as a, a rich uh, entitled snob like his mom. And, and that maybe his dad might be proud of him because he always felt like his dad saw him as, um, as a Randolph. And that was his mom's maiden name. And so, uh, but, but one way or another, you definitely see multiple layers of Jefferson. And, um, but that is a common thing that you find in three and four is both of these sources and virtually every source I've had my hands on about Jefferson convey that um, when he was aggressive, it was passive aggressive. Uh, that he just was not a confrontational person at all. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh huh. So yeah, please read these, okay? And um, let's see here. I'm trying to see what. So Friday, we have um, eight the War of eighteen twelve due. And so we have a meeting on Thursday, but you know what? With Thursday, I would kind of like to do a test two to give you all the time you need for the following Monday. So if you guys don't mind, I want to jump to the War of 1812, okay? And I, I won't be that long because this one, like the Constitution assignment, is different. It's not um, argumentatively set up. It's just this right here. I ask you to go on to a PBS video on the War of 1812 and simply answer these questions. So again, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, this is the only, this is the reason why I only do this once is uh, I'm not proud of this format. I, I think you, you, um, you critically think, and you derive much more from an argumentative assignment than you do from this type of traditional right answer, wrong answer, uh, superficial knowledge stuff. But to be honest, I just, I couldn't think of more of like one or two arguments uh, presently uh, to derive from the War of 1812. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so it is what it is presently. I apologize. If, uh, for that, uh, for that reason, but here it is. So who did the U.S. fight in the War of 1812? Very upfront questions. Uh, no, they fought more than England, okay? They fought more than Great Britain. They also fought the Native American tribes. That was part of the reason why they went to war, it was against the Red Sticks, uh, the tribes that painted their, their uh, tomahawks red and sided with England against us. How is Canada connected to the story? From the video you'll see, we tried a three-pronged invasion attempt into Canada. 
And needless to say, as you see, Canada is still under Great Britain. It did not go well. Uh, what reason or two is given for poor American military prowess? You're going to find evidence of, uh, suggesting that the state militias were very jealous of their own autonomy. They didn't want a federal government telling them what to do with their state's soldiers. A lot of them had an issue with invading a sovereign separate country. And a lot of them literally stopped at the Canadian border and refused to cross, uh, et cetera. Uh, poorly provisioned, not enough money, et cetera. Uh, four, how does William Henry Harrison play the villain in the narrative? And it makes it pretty clear. Just watch the video. Uh, notice, right, that in the Ohio Valley, that land, on the one hand, you see something enlightened about that land. And that is, is in the Articles of Confederation, they decided that in the uh, Indiana, Illinois, and Ohio, uh, the three states underneath the Great Lakes, right? And I'm sorry, I should have a map here, um, that um, they were going to divvy it out into um, uh, it's like uh, 60 square acre plots, so many of them constitute a county, so many of them constitute a state, um, uh, have the, um, the, the, the land surveyors come and survey all the land and put it up for a uh, public um, sale, right? Um, and they had a very methodical manner by which under the Northwest ordinances, as they're called, uh, new territories will become slowly incorporated into the union as new states, right? So remember when something is a territory, uh, it's not entitled to a Republican form of government as the constitution says every state is entitled to. It's not connected to the bill of rights, uh, et cetera. It, it's a territory. It's under a different, you know, entirely different uh, domain or, or, you know, um, category. So, but they had it set up to form it into those three separate states of Indiana, Illinois, and Ohio. And uh, they also said that slavery will be prohibited in those future states. And you have to get a certain number of people in the states. And then once you get to that certain number, then you have a referendum and you uh, elect um, people to go to a legislative convention. They go to the convention and write up a state constitution they send that state constitution to Congress and Congress must approve it. And then, and only then they become a state entitled to the bill of rights and everything under the federal constitution. So in that, you know, meantime, if you will, this territory was highly contested, uh, namely between the native American tribes amongst one another and also with us. So while we have this confederation, uh, some of the tribes had chosen Great Britain in our war for independence. And of course, we have a very vindictive tradition whereby, you know, when Native American tribes choose the wrong side, uh, we tend to deal punitively and, and, and punish them afterwards, after the wars. And so this was no different. And so some of the major tribes like the Iroquois, and others that claimed a lot of that land in the Ohio Valley, we said, no, it's not yours. You chose England and we won the war for independence. And so um, we don't recognize the treaties that England uh, granted you over this land. And then other tribes resented tribes like the Iroquois for their sense of entitlement and conquest over them. And so they fought amongst one another as well. And so then uh, President, um, uh, so during the, the Confederation, it was a mess in there. Uh, there was a guy named Little Turtle, there was a guy named Pontiac, and they, they had these rebellions amongst Native Americans. And um, we, we, our claim over the Ohio Valley was basically just on paper during the Confederation. So when we write the Constitution of 1787 and Washington has elected our first president, um, he's done fooling around with the natives, right? And he sends in a military governor 
Well, the first one he sent in uh, was killed. So then he sent in a second one who had more success. But that temporal success on the battlefield only exacerbated tension in, in bad relations, right? As war all, always does. And so um, it went, such was the same for the first three presidencies. And then Madison comes along and he gives the okay to William Henry Harrison. And William Henry Harrison is seen in this video as just being uh, the typical arrogant pale face, the typical arrogant white man in the Native American's historiography. He comes in and he starts trying to bully the natives off their land. He starts granting land that is not, that, that is contested by the natives, but he contends he has the right as a military governor to grant it uh, to the settlers. He uh, at first tried to force the natives to sell him uh, more and more lands, as you'll see in the video. And so he just plays that part. And so then a, a couple brothers rise up and they try to unify the tribes uh, to kick us out of that valley. And the military leader was Tecumseh and the religious prophet and charismatic secular leader, uh, his brother, Tenskwatawa who was uh, known as generically as the prophet. And it just brought the worst out of Harrison. Harrison threatened to arrest Tecumseh uh, as well as his brother, the prophet. Um, he tried to demean the prophet because the prophet was trying religious ways to gain a following in that Ohio Valley uh, in what was called Provincetown. Um, he uh, supposedly uh, predicted a lunar uh, or a solar eclipse and tried to do other works of, of miracles publicly to try to gain credence from the people. And he was trying to contend, right, that, that the Native American gods were with the Native Americans and they were going to kick the pale face out uh, for good. So it had a, a threatening undertone to it that that scared the likes of the military governor, uh, William Henry Harrison. So uh, according to the video and the books that I've read is uh, Harrison ended up picking a fight and he got the fight he wanted uh, at the Battle of Tippecanoe and the Americans won, but not after losing uh, several men. And when they were burying the Native Americans that they had killed, they found that they had English muskets and they had evidence of some of their leaders having met at the Canadian border, uh, some of the British uh, commanders in the military because the British still hadn't left some of the forts that were even in US territory around the Great Lakes. And so um, that will be one of the two official reasons, uh, number five, by which we declare war against Great Britain in the War of 1812 is um, we claim that the British fomented or instigated rebellion amongst our Native Americans in the Ohio Valley. Then the other reason is you'll see in the video, uh, the Napoleonic Wars were going on and there was already a notion of international rights. Even though Geneva won't happen until the Crimean War in the mid 1800s, so still a generation away, they'd already met several times in conventions in London, Paris, Berlin, et cetera, uh, the major powers of Europe and signed accords, uh, which um, aligned with the Catholic church's traditional notions of just war doctrine. And just war doctrine, which was religious in its origins, like I said, with the Catholic church was basically stated it's the beginning of like the the geneva conventions uh, to this day is um the reasons for which you go to war must be just and the manner by which you fight war must also be just those are the two broad categories that it falls under so the latter right the manner by which it's fought it had been decided at multiple conventions that neutral merchants from neutral countries 
ought to have the right to ship and trade with any country they want, including, quote, belligerents, countries that are at war. But there is a list, right, and that it, you, it can include something on that special list. And as you could easily guess, that list means anything to do with military um, assistance. And with, from where we get the term contraband against the list. So as long as you're selling food, clothing, you know, non-military objects, then you have the right, you have the international right to sell and buy, et cetera, with any country you want, including a or both belligerents at war. And you'll see on the video how both countries, especially England, violated that right of ours. And everything else is pretty self-explanatory. All you have to do is just watch the video. All right. And another point that the video will make, as you'll see, is the War of 1812 kind of unified us for a generation or so, as far as instilling patriotism. It supposedly convinced a lot of people from both political parties that there needs to be more centralized planning of the economy and, um, and more of a of a standing armed forces. Because even though it's going to end in a stalemate, uh, we were humiliated more than once by the British in this war. But another thing is with tribes that chose to go against us. In the video, they're called red sticks, particularly like the creek down in the south. It became an ulterior motive for some Southerners and Westerners who are poor and ambitious to join this war and vote for this war so that we could fight these red stick Native Americans and then at the end of the war, take their land from them. All right. So are there any questions? Like I said, I think the rest of it will be pretty self-explanatory when you watch the video. Hi, Professor. Um, I actually had a question, but I actually wanted to ask one-on-one. Um, -on -one. So do you mind like staying a little later? Not at all. Disney? Not at all. Okay, I'll, I'll just wait. You got it. Okay, not a problem. All right. So anybody else? Are we are are we okay regarding um, the the early republic and the War of eighteen twelve? By all means, don't be shy. Uh, anything that wasn't clearly expressed, please let me know. All right. So if that's okay with you guys, I will let all of you but one go. All right. And so so that she could ask me um, her her uh, assignment question uh, in privacy. And so uh, thank you to the rest of you. You guys take care. Thank you for your patience. And like I said, um, I plan on being uh, much more on the ball uh, from here on out. All right, so thank you for your patience and hang in there, okay? Thank you for your help. Thank Thanks. You. No See you Thursday. Bye bye. See you Thursday.
Um, I believe everyone left professor. So I just had a quick question. Sure. Um, so I actually needed extra time with the assignment that was due yesterday. Sure. So do you mind give me, giving me like a day or two extra? It's because I had a family emergency this weekend. Um, it was regarding my mother because um, she hasn't been feeling well and she does not speak English. So I have to go with her with appointments and getting her medication. I have to go like translate with her and stuff. Absolutely. So I've been like, my focus has been like on there lately. And then um, uh, that's why I just needed um, like a day or two to like catch up with the work. Of course, of course, hon. I'd be, ha I'd be happy to do that. And so um, the, particular, the particular assignment that you're talking about, I'm assuming is, is, is what, the, um, the early republic? No, I think it's, uh, I've turned in everything else. It's the Constitution one, I think. The Constitution. You know where the four, yeah, the format was different. We had to uh, do like three categories and then we had to put the sections and then That's give right. a sentence or two to explain why um, the certain section belonged into that category. That's right. Yeah, so I've looked at it. It's just like, I, I haven't finished it. That's why. No problem. Yeah, yeah no so problem. I would, I'm going to try my best to like finish it hopefully by tomorrow and then I'll get it into you as soon as I can. You got it. That works for me. All right. Thank you so much, Professor. I hope you have a nice day. You as well. I hope your mom is okay. Yeah, she's feeling uh, like quite, um, I, I don't know what's like the deal. It's because she's been like dizzy a lot lately. Really? And um, it's just like she's had this problem before and it was a couple of years back and it took a, a while for it to like go away. And then now it, it's occurring again. And I just don't want her to go through what she went like last time, because I know last time she, um, you know, she lost a lot of weight and it, it was just all bad. And that's why I'm trying to like I'm trying to get uh, get her treated as fast as like, you know, she can be well. Absolutely. You know, I, what, what I'm about to say might be absolutely irrelevant to the case of your mom, mm -hmm. but in my personal case, about uh, probably about close to 10, between five and 10 years ago, mm -hmm. I was getting habitually so dizzy. I couldn't function from day to day. Yes. And I went to a doctor regarding my allergies mm -hmm. and it, and it, and I, I don't think it's a coincidence that my, my dizziness went away. Yeah, so actually. Just in my case, uh, I, can't, I can't vouch for your mom. But yeah. in my case, uh, my dizziness was, I think, caused by extreme allergies. Yeah, because I know a couple years back, because right now I'm like 18. But back then, I remember because I've always been translating for my mom. And uh -huh. I think I was probably like 12 or 13 at that time. And I know like doctors, they send her over for MRIs, and for like all these examinations and stuff. Like right. I was literally taking my mom like doctor from doctor because they couldn't figure it out. Oh, wow. And um, like uh, they were like, Oh, it's maybe her job because my mom does do a job that requires a lot of labor. So uh -huh. they're like, it, it could be because she's always standing up while she's doing like her job. Right. And uh, so they're like, oh, it could just be her posture or it can be um, some sort of nasal sinus and stuff. So they couldn't really figure it out. And it just went. Um, and then but she got like kind of she cured uh, like she healed herself on her own, to be honest. But it took a lot of time. Uh -huh. But now I'm like, just like, I don't want her to go through like what she went through last time. Exactly. But as of now, they're just giving her like antibiotics for, they're saying it's like a, a certain type of si uh, um, sinus. Yeah. So uh, they're like, and they're saying like, there's some sort of like fluid, like, I don't know. It's like hard to explain. Oh, that would do it. Uh, yeah. and her eustachian tube or something like that if she's got fluid staying in there that would mm -hmm. that would mess up her equilibrium for sure yeah and then i had to um then i had to get like a doctor's note for her work and it was just like so many things to do but I, okay. she's doing well now so i hopefully she'll be better soon good i hope so yeah but thank you so much for understanding no problem
All, All right. right. So you have a good one, okay, Ravinder? Okay, see you next Thursday. Sounds good. All right, bye. All right, bye-bye.